My brother and I grew up in an anxious household with a mom who had a tendency for chronic depression and anxiety and a father who was emotionally unavailable, which at times made things worse. We grew up in a house where there was so much emphasis on academic achievement, but so little on interpersonal and emotional development. So as a result, me and my brother would grow up, but we would also grow apart. But my parents got what they wanted, the dream of all Arab parents, to see their children become doctors and engineers. Our story started just a few years ago. After seven years of studying abroad, when I would finish my medical degree and become a doctor, and my brother would finish his master's in mechanical engineering, we would meet and reunite for the first time and live together. At first, I thought it was gonna be strange living with him. But to my surprise, we instantly connected. It felt like he was a roommate in a past life. For starters, what I discovered is that my brother was suffering exactly from the same mental health problems I was suffering from. Anxiety, depression, psychosomatic symptoms. And we would spend all our time just talking and sharing our stories and telling each other about our experience in mental health. And I must say, it felt great to have somebody to talk to, somebody that really would understand what I've been through. But to be honest, the one and the most single thing that connected me and my brother was our passion and our love for science. We just loved talking about scientific ideas and concepts in science. We would spend countless nights talking about artificial intelligence, psychology, the human brain, we would particularly intersect on topics that came between mechanical engineering and the human brain. And it was in this exercise of talking about the human brain and talking about the mechanical nature of the mind where me and my brother would stumble across an idea, one key concept that would change our lives forever. To me, it's funny how one idea we learned about how our brain works, learning how our mind works, helped our mind work better. It fascinates me that one key concept in neuroscience has the power and the potential and the promise to change and transform people's mental health. And this key concept is known as brain plasticity. In my specialty, we call it neuroplasticity. But to understand neuroplasticity, we must first come to an appreciation to what the brain actually is. The human brain, the most technologically advanced agent in the universe, made out of billions and billions of neurons with trillions and trillions more in synapses and connections between these neurons. A true connectome. But to understand brain plasticity, we would have to stop at the first checkpoint, which is the neuron, the building cell of the brain. And to understand the neuron, we would have to zoom in to a very small and fine scale inside the brain structure. Neuroplasticity describes a new image, a new picture, one that is very different to the old thoughts we had about the brain. Our thoughts about the brain being dynamic, being uh, fixed and unchanging. Our thoughts, our old beliefs about the brain being uh, an agent that doesn't change in adulthood. Brain plasticity is a phenomenon that explains a very different picture. What brain plasticity emphasizes is that if we look at a single neuron, a single cell in the brain, and we realize that with continuous stimulus, and this stimulus can be anything, an emotion, a feeling, a behavior, a habit, an exercise, an experience, the repetition of the experience, the repetition of the stimulus would cause a phenomenon known as neurogenesis. And what neurogenesis means is the creation of new neurons when there was none before. This idea is fascinating. The simple shifting between one cell to, be to have more neurons and have more neurogenesis on one side is known as neurogenesis, which is what we describe now. But on the reverse process, 
something called synaptic pruning, which means if you don't use these nerve cell or you don't use this particular circuit, you will start losing connections. And I think most of you here agree. By show of hands, who has become really good at something through simply by training every day at it? And then by show of hands, who has lost a talent, lost a skill, by not training for a period of time? Simple, right? Neuroscience is much simpler than people make it out to be. Synaptic pruning explains exactly that. The neurons that we use will grow, but in synaptic pr pruning, the neurons and the part of our brains that we don't use, we will lose synapses and lose surface area in this dimension. But to even understand neuroplasticity on a deeper sense, we have to zoom in beyond the neurons themselves and look at the fine space between the terminal endings of where neurons connect. A very small space that is actually the size of a virus, 20 nanometers. If we zoom into the space, we can come to comprehend and look at brain plasticity in a new way. And in that fine space where two neurons meet, an increase in simulation, an increase in stimulus, or an increase in the firing activation of those two networks, what will happen is something, a phenomenon called long-term potentiation. And we will see transformations in the presynaptic knob, where we will start releasing more neurotransmitters, and we find transformation in the postsynaptic knob, where we will build more receptors to receive those messages. All in all, increasing the activation and the power of the signal in those neurons, building a more intimate relationship between these two neurons. The research on neuroplasticity has become fascinating. And those changes we talked about on a micro level have a larger and a bigger effect on a macro scale. In University of Cambridge, we discovered that cab drivers who use their visual spatial part of their brain, cab drivers because they have to memorize the maps and the city in a visual perspective, we found out that cab drivers have an increase in the volume of their posterior hippocampus. At the same time, we found out that children who suffer from anxiety and stressed homes have an increased number of networks and size in their amygdala which is a part of the limbic brain responsible for the fear response. But what's amazing is that we also found out that people who meditate and practice mindfulness have an increase in the size of the prefrontal cortex, but at the same time, people who are suffering from stress have a shrinking in their prefrontal cortex. This idea is fascinating. The idea itself is so powerful to know that your brain is a dynamic, responsive organ that is always capable of changing. The idea itself is so powerful that it got me thinking that could my anxiety today, my mental health problems today, my negative thoughts, my complaining, my self-doubt, could all these features be no more or no less than hyper-connected circuits conditioned by childhood? conditioned by the flow and passing of time. The idea is so powerful. And the second question that arises, if that neuroplasticity is something that does not stop, it can, it's always constantly changing until you die. If that's the case, then the question is, can I change my mental health perspective? Can I change the way I see myself and I see the world? And the answer is absolutely yes. The idea was so powerful that it helped me and my brother transform our perspective of mental health. We became better. We didn't go to a doctor. We didn't take any medication. It was just the power of the idea that my brain is plastic, my brain is dynamic. That in itself transformed us. Now I know many people think it's too romantic to say that ideas can change us. But this is why I'm here today. This is why I love the TED conference so much. Because it's on this stage where we humans celebrate the most powerful and impactful ideas in the world. Actually, the TED mission on the website is we believe passionately in the power of ideas to change attitudes, lives, and ultimately the world. And we've seen through history how the greatest ideas came out of the greatest conflicts and greatest problems. For a great idea, you need a great conflict or a great problem. 
And we've seen time and time again through history how, the, how ideas, just simple ideas, have the power to transform culture and human thinking. One great example on that is the Renaissance. How single concepts, a school of ideas from humanism, ideas about how important humanity was, ideas about how important education was, ideas alone were powerful enough to usher in a new renaissance, a rebirth in Europe, linking the bridge between the dark ages and the modern world. But a more powerful example is the Apollo 8 mission from NASA. The spacecraft takes a picture of the first ever Earthrise phenomenon. We see our fragile blue planet suspended in the blackness of space. The picture was so powerful that only in the next couple of years after we received this picture, the power in this picture was powerful enough to change our cultural laws and our political systems relating to environmental protection. Actually, in a matter of only two years, we, we, we invented the first Environmental Earth Protection Agency, we called the first Earth Day, and we banned DDT, and we started suddenly caring about the Earth and the environment, just from a single shot of the planet from space. Far away from politics and environmental protection. My name is Hani Akashe and I'm aspiring to one day be a psychiatrist. And I spend most of my time searching for ideas that can have the power and the potential to change a crisis that I think is way bigger and way more complex than global warming or politics. A crisis that I think sits at the heart of all our problems. And this crisis is the mental health crisis. To me, I feel like the world is suffering a collective soul sickness. The statistics don't lie. Anxiety and depression are being diagnosed at traits we've never seen before. Neuropsychiatric disorders are now among the leading cause of disability in the planet. And sadly, and according to the World Health Organization, 800,000 people commit suicide every year. That is more than the number of people who die from armed conflict and natural disasters combined. But all the statistics I tell you about, they mostly come from developed countries. When it comes to developing countries like our Jordan, the statistics become scarier. According to the World Health Organization, six of the most urgent countries in the world in need of mental health reform were chosen. And Jordan was chosen as the lead country to receive that action plan. This to me reflects the desperate state of mental health in my country, and it breaks my heart. But we said great ideas come out of great conflicts. We need a great problem to have a great idea. This is when my brother and I thought of an idea that could activate, that can catalyze a healing process, raising awareness on mental health in Jordan. And this was drawn out of our personal ex inspirational experience ourselves. How when we learned about the human brain, it helped us develop our mental health. It helped us optimize our perception of mental health. So we thought maybe we could do something about the mental health issue in Jordan. We decided to open our first neuroeducation company. A company that is specialized in teaching people key concepts in neuroscience that we thought could help them change their perspective of mental health. We used visual animations, technology. We wanted to create a fun and exciting way for people to discover more about their brains. And we were so lucky and so blessed to have our company grow so fast in such a short time. Working with people from across the spectrum, working with universities, tech companies, corporate giants. When we put this idea and we reached out to adults suffering from stress and anxiety, and when we told them about brain plasticity and the relationship between the frontal cortex and the amygdala, the power of the message itself gave them intrinsic motivation to understand how powerful meditation and mindfulness can be in controlling your anxiety and your stress symptoms. But the real results were when we, work, when we started working with children. When we taught little kids about brain plasticity, the power of the idea itself 
push them to a more growth-oriented mindset. It's like now they know that they can face their challenges. That change is inevitable if you keep practicing and you keep working. And we already know from great researchers like Carol Dweck that the mindset of children will really be a huge indicator to their success in later stages of life. Actually, one of the sweetest things, we got a message from one of the parents who we've given in this uh, workshop to their children. And she described in the message how mathematics stopped becoming a nightmare for these children and started becoming something they enjoy. <laughs> this is the power of understanding our brain. This is the power of understanding how, how dynamic and changing our brains are. And brain plasticity, when it's given to children, it can really revolutionize the way how they see themselves. But this idea also struck a new thought about the process. We saw how brain plasticity and teaching people about their brains at a younger age had a bigger impact than elder or older people. So we thought to ourselves that the mental health problem in Jordan is too big to solve it by just going around and giving people workshops and teaching them about the brain. If we really wanted to address the mental health issue in Jordan, we would have to address this issue at its root. And we already know that mental health diseases are diseases of childhood. And if we wanted to address this problem, we would have to go back to childhood. So this is why my brother and I, again this summer, we opened our first nonprofit program, a program dedicated to bringing neuroscience programs and neuroscience training to kindergarten teachers, particularly kindergarten teachers. It was our hope that the message of neuroplasticity and the message in brain plasticity had the most powerful and most powerful impact and had the most potential to change when we gave it to younger people and when we gave it to the caregivers, the educators and the policymakers involved in early brain development. We knew that when the teachers and the parents and the policymakers involved in early brain development knew about the critical period of brain development in children, when they knew how plastic and how fragile their minds are, and when they knew that the first years of life dictate and design the structure of the brain of the children forever. On a very small sample scale yet, we've already found, figured out and found out that after teachers and kindergartens learned about brain plasticity and learned about how the brains work, we found out that this message itself, the power and the hope in the message itself, was able to, develop more, able to help the teachers develop more empathy, more patience, and more love towards the children. It's like now they understand the children. They understand how these children grow and develop. On such a small scale, when the teachers figured out that at six years of age, 90% of the brain development of the children would have been complete, which means that the quality of interactions in the first six years of life will design the brain forever. When teachers were able to wake up to their true role in society, to their role as actual designers of the children's brains and their lives, that in itself motivated them and gave them the true uh, image that they need to work with, the true organ that they need to work with. To finalize, my message is go and learn about your brain. There's good news. There's a mental health renaissance happening all over the world. So everybody now is caring a bit more about mental health, particularly in Jordan. We can see it in the meditation centers, in the holistic centers, in the breathing workshops. The world is slowly waking up. But to me, there is nothing more powerful, there is nothing more promising for your own mental health renaissance, for your own transformation, than understanding your brain. When you understand your brain, you will begin to have empathy for yourself and for others. When you understand your brain, you will be able to comprehend that the world you create is always creating you back. Discovering your brain will also let you be more mindful and more aware on where you spend your time. How do you spend your free hours? Who do you talk to? Who do you go out with? How much do you read? All your choices, all these micro choices you do in your life are ultimately changing the network and structure of your brain, your personality and your future. And they always told us that trying to change the world will only lead to more suffering. Trying to change the world is impossible. 
and we should rather more fo focus on changing ourselves. But what if the message, the truth and the hope and the message that we can actually change ourselves become a template in which we can actually change the world? Thank you.